Brother Robert's text is 1 Peter 4, 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Now, this having charity, in our text, is not referring to a temporal or benevolence type, which would be like giving money to somebody to pay their electric bill, house payment, you know, etc. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what this text is saying. Um, the dictionary put it as a love of mankind, or kindness or tolerance in judging. I'm not real happy with that one. Um, this kind of charity is like, it's a, it's a charity for the brethren's welfare of eternity. It's, it's, uh, that's what is in mind here. Um, our text is not saying overlook sin. And I'm going to finish with Ephesians, Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Yes. So with this in mind, have charity towards one another. Amen. Those words, I've been blessed during this time. I've been blessed during thinking about this time. For the last few months, I've been blessed thinking about this time. And, um, you know, I was thinking how God um, started started this whole project here you've got you've got the only two perfect people in the whole world they only were given one thing to do don't eat of this tree and yet they were beguiled and and at least eve was and she took of the tree and she ate it and she gave it to her husband with her and and he ate of it what a way to start start the account and then they know they, they realize. So they go and they, they hide. They sow fig leaves together and they hear God in the cool. Then they hide. They hide from the presence of God. Now, what a way to start the account off. So God comes. You notice that God didn't say, Satan, where are you? He says, Adam, where are you? Now, that wasn't that God didn't know. God knew exactly where they were. But God wanted them to know. See, there, there had come a time they, when Adam and Eve both had to come into the presence of God, and they had to give an answer. Now, God, right from the beginning, right from the beginning, God's made us aware that we're not going to get away with anything. There isn't anybody that's going to get away with anything. God knows, and yet he makes them confess what has happened. Man's never handled coming into the presence of God in the flesh very well. So, Satan, you can only imagine. You can only imagine Satan's saying, I got them now. Oh, look at this. They're going to they're, they're gonna give an account to God, and, and I'm just waiting for this moment when God condemns them. And yet, what does God do? He loves them. This is a demonstration. Now, speaking as a man... I can almost see the Lord leaning over to his son saying, the demonstration has begun. Yeah. The, God's been divulging his nature. And how would a God so mighty and great as our God do this? Well, this is, when you open up the, the book and you start at Genesis, you start seeing this is the way God has determined to make himself known. The heavens were looking on that day. They never seen, as far as we know, they had never seen God act like this. This demonstration of his mercy, of his love, of his kindness towards those who are created in his image. Oh, this, this is unparalleled in the history of time and even before time. God showing, I am a God of mercy, a God of love. Now, see, this is going to be demonstrated even fuller later toward the end of time when, when God infuses this kind of love in people. And they start demonstrating this kind of love. That's what we're talking about this weekend. This is, there's a special kind of love. The, the men in the flesh, they can't perceive the love of God. They, they don't have the equipment. Now, see, they're, they're, um, 
every man to some degree is given to love. Some men are in love just for the sake of being in love. It makes them feel good. And so they, they seek after love. But see, they can't know this kind of love. Not unless you're in the person of Christ Jesus. He says, you think, well, all right, now you got people that are in the Spirit. They've been given of the Holy Spirit. They, they're walking in the Spirit. They're, they have faith. God gave them faith. And they believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of them to diligently seek after him. And yet he gives them this exhortation in 1 Peter. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Now that isn't to the world. He isn't talking to the world. And he's saying, you guys ought to love each other so you can be like us. That's not what he's saying. He's talking to the church. Those who have the ability. They have this new ability in Christ Jesus to be able to love one another with a fervent love. So now you, you be sober and you watch unto prayer. These are all good exhortations. But above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Now after you've done all things and you're able to stand in the evil day, you're, you're ready now. You have fervent charity among yourselves. After you've crucified the flesh with the affections of the lust, and that's got to be done, you have fervent charity among yourselves. After you've studied to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, it's only in the presence of God now, you have fervent charity among yourself. After every other requirement of God's been completed, and all is well with your soul, at the end of the day, you're going to have a need to have fervent charity among yourselves. After you put on these bowels of mercies, after you put on kindness, and after you put on humbleness of mind and put on meekness and long suffering, and you're fair forbearing one another, it's got to be mixed with this fervent love that you have one to another. He says, above all these things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. You might say it like this, before you can do anything or any of those things effectively, put on charity, which makes everything else effective. Why, why, are, why do you do the things that you do? Why, why, why do you love the brethren? Well, so I, I dare say some people think they love the brethren or, or try to love the brethren so they'll be seen of men. Look at how good I am. I know that brother did something to me, but... But in my greatness, I forgave him. You see, this is, this is a matter of the heart. This is a matter of perspective. Why, why do you want to benefit the people of God? Now, even in the ages to come, even in the ages to come, we're going to continue to love one another. See, so it, now this is like a primer. We're like right now we're getting ready. We're learning how to love them. And, and, and it's more than interesting that it's set in an environment where loving them would seem like this thing to be the most difficult thing to do. They have flesh, just like you have flesh. Sometimes their flesh gets in the way. Now, love covers a multitude of sins. Why? Because that's exactly what we need for the time that we're in. Right now, we need a kind of love that's able to overlook flesh. Now... I don't want to give anybody the idea that it's, it's saying that love excuses sin because that's not what he's talking about. Well, I, I hope to be able to, to make that clear because that does need to be clarified in the day we're living in. Before Jesus left, he gave us a new commandment. Remember? In um, John 13, 34, it's recorded, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, that's a special kind of love. That's the kind of love. Now, Jesus can be on the cross, and men can be crucifying him, and he can look down and he say, he can say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't. Now, see, this is the same spirit of God in the garden. God could have come down and, and condemned them. He had every reason. But see, what did Adam and Eve went through the rest of their life with this in their mind? God isn't looking for a reason to condemn me. He had it. He had it right there in the garden. We were standing before him. We were guilty. And he didn't condemn us. He blessed us. 
oh, this is, this is the kind of God that, that we serve, and this is the kind of love that he's deposited into his people, the kind that isn't looking for a reason to condemn his brethren, looking for a reason to bless them. What can I do to bless my brethren? Well, this is not, all of us know, this did not come from the flesh. Amen. Flesh and blood did not produce this kind of love. Right. Looking for a reason to bless someone just so you can get a blessing back. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about an, un, an, un, an unfailing love, one that will be present because it's needed, not because it's maybe sometime in the future I can get something. That's kind of what the Pharisees had, wasn't it? That was kind of the way they loved, positioned themselves to love the people that they could get the most out of. Then Jesus said something that's very unique to the kingdom of God. That ye also, talking about the, the, just like I've loved you, that you also love one another by this. Oh, this is what I want to be known for. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. This cannot be hidden. If you, if you love, it will get out. It will. You can't, you, you can't have this love burning inside of you and it not shine forth, and it will. In other, in other words, God will produce circumstances where this kind of love that's in you is used. All right, now, if, if you love your brother and the, the way that Jesus loved you, expect some, some of the brethren to need this kind of love. Now, wait a minute, that means that some people might actually sin against you. This is what he said, John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now... If you have this kind of love inside of you that you would lay down your life for your friends, if, that's, that's, if you, your love is so intense that you would do this, well, then expect that something's going to happen that you're going to have to lay down your life. Because what is love if it's never demonstrated? What, how could you possibly know or prove that you had this kind of love if you were never called upon to demonstrate it? So God, see, God's, God's controlling this whole thing. This isn't, I'm so glad that we're not. God, God leads you into the areas that you need. You need to go through this particular area because you need to, to a circumstance wherein you can use the faith that he's given you. You can use this love and you can, it can be demonstrated that God's love is in you. And yet the person you're loving desperately needs someone to come up and help them and to love them. So see, God's, God's working this whole thing out. This is sort of the same thing that was written in the law. Leviticus said, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Don't do it. Say, well, but they did it to me and they deserve and blah, blah. You, you want to talk about what we deserve? See, we've gone too far. We, we've forgotten too much if we want to talk about what we deserve. Because wait, you look in the mirror. You want to talk about what you deserve, look in the mirror and you'll find out. You didn't deserve mercy. You didn't. I don't, I don't have to know what you did. I can tell you right now, you didn't deserve mercy. There was something else. There was another tag, price tag on what you did. And it was the death of Christ. He had to pay the price. So see, now when you're, when you're put in this position, see that... That, that's, you're of the wrong spirit if you even think like that. So we need, we need our, our minds readjusted from time to time. Why, why did I even think like that? Well, because flesh thinks like that. Flesh is always going to think like that. What can I get out of it? What, what, what do I get in this deal? Well, you're going to get salvation. He says, don't, don't bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. <laughs> if anybody could, yeah, I mean, you, I can, you see somebody else and they transgress against somebody else and yet that person loves them anyway. I, there isn't any greater way to demonstrate the love of God. This is the way God's done it. He's worked it out this way to where we can see every day. We can see the demonstration of God's love because we need to see it. When people insist on bearing grudges against their brethren, well, 
just to say it lightly, they're on very slippery ground. See, they, they've attached way too much emphasis to themselves and not as enough emphasis to God. Now, Peter, he says, he focuses, focuses his, his attention on the fervency of this charity. Have fervent charity. Now, the word fervent is to extend yourself, and, and it has the, the connotation of without ceasing. It's not like, well, today I'm going to have fervent charity today, but tomorrow, well. No, this, it's an unceasing. This is something you're, you're loving because you've been loved. See, and obviously in that context, you can do it. If you can, if you can see in the circumstance, well, God forgave me of, of a lot of sin. He forgave me. Now, how, how can I possibly withhold forgiveness from my brother who, who has sinned against me? I sinned against God and he forgave me. You see, you see how God's given us a context to where we can reason these things out. Of course, see, the flesh isn't reasonable, so you can't do this in the flesh. It's got to be done in the spirit. Amen. Charities. It's, it, it's something that you can enter into and never go wrong. You know, I, I like that, though. I can never go wrong by loving my brother. Never. It'll never be the wrong thing to love my brother. Just love him. Now, there's no... There's no um, there's no doubt about this, that um, if, if you do this, there's going to be a price tag attached to it. You, you're not going to love your brethren for free. It's going to cost you something. Yeah, it is. It, you're going to have, it's just a, it's just a self-sacrifice. It's like God. What did it cost him? Well, he's, his son came and he died. But it cost him to love you. So, so if you love your brethren, it's, there's a price tag. You're going to have to pay a price. And that price is actually... Jesus tells you if you don't deny yourself, deny yourself. You have to deny yourself in salvation. Well, see, now he's given us an avenue where this is actually possible. You can deny yourself and forgive your brother. I don't know how you could forgive him in any other environment. I don't know, I don't know how you could love yourself and forgive. You wouldn't do that. So see, he's got, just by following Christ, you're, it's like he he's set the situation up to where you can love your brother. Because you have... You're, you, I don't love myself like I used to love myself. I used to love myself. In fact, there's still a part of me that wants to love myself. I thought, when well, you get back on the cross, you're on the cross. I'm crucifying you. Amen. I don't know. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody said, you know, I don't know why he keeps sticking his, himself out there for that person. They don't deserve it. You know, somebody sees that you're loving your brother. and like, why are you doing that? Come on, you go out of your way to help people. What do you do that for? You know, the nice guy always loses, you know. That's the way the world is. Every good deed is met by some kind of punishment. You know, you heard that. Have fervent charity among yourselves. See, don't let the world define what you should do for, for your brother. Don't. They don't even know what you're doing. All they can do is they can see what you're doing, but they don't know what you're doing. They, they can't understand it. Well, others may say, why doesn't he just leave us alone? Doesn't he know we don't want to hear the things he has to say? He keeps, every time he comes around, he starts talking about that book and about that man, Jesus. Can he figure it out? We don't want nothing to do with him. But they don't know you're loving him. They don't know. So should we stop loving them? Should we stop telling them about Christ? Because, see, love really got to be defined within the context of eternity. Fervent charity perseveres even in the face of op opposition. Even when people don't want you to love them, you can love them. Now, the charity's first definition is affection or benevolence, and Sister Anita touched on that somewhat. Charity's distinct in that you have the other person's at heart and not your own. So, I mean, you, if you're going to do something, even if you're going to pay their bills, it, it's got, something's driving you besides just the person. You, 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 you want to see them get out of that condition. It's not like I want to pay your bills forever. It's, a, it's, it's that I, I, I want to see you excel. I want to see you get strong and excel. Well, see, like the person, remember the Good Samaritan? He, did, he wasn't like going to say, all right, you can stay in the inn forever, and I'll just, you know. No, he wanted him to get better and to get out there and be that, but see, he loved them. That's why he did it. He loved them. But see, this is the world doesn't understand it. They're, the world will look at it and say, well, 
Well, hey, this is kind of a nice arrangement. You see what I'm saying? See, the person that, that loves a person doesn't want them to become dependent on that. They want, they want them to, to grow to where they can express their love for other people, too. See, this is, this is something charity covers the multitude of sins. And I already said this, but you notice that it doesn't say that charity excuses sin. Now, Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So see, it isn't like, and I, I use this as an example because it helped me to understand in, in the context of this. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of a woman by the name of Ma Barker. Now, she was famous around the Missouri area, Tulsa and in Oklahoma and, and uh, up in Kansas. She had six or seven boys, and they were a murderous lot of boys. I mean, they were bad, killing all kinds of people, robbing banks. Well, in between the bank robberies and the, and the, the murderous activity, they'd stop by mom's house. And she'd feed them. She'd fix up their wounds if they were. And then she'd send them back out to go do some more evil stuff. Now, she, she didn't think she was so bad because she just loved her boys. She just loved them so much. They were her children, after all. And so, you know, it went on and on for years. They killed close to 100 people, robbed many things. And now, the, now the, the authorities, they said she was an accomplice. She was an accomplice because she took care of them and gave them aid and benefit, even though she knew that, that um, they were out there murdering people. Now... I thought about this. You know, a lot of people think that this, this verse is talking like that. Like cover, love covers them all. No matter what you've done, no matter where you're at, we're going to love you anyway. We're going to love you right into the kingdom. We're just going to love you. Uh, but see, this, this isn't the way it is. That's not what it's talking about. That woman really was an accomplice. She was aiding them and, and actually promoting the death of a lot of people. Instead of calling the police and saying... So see, that this kind of love, this maternal love, is, is what she would have thought it was, is not what this is talking about. Now, David, I mean, I'm, I'm going to comment something on what Brother John Calvin said about this, about this verse in Proverbs 10, 12. Hate stirreth up strives, but love covereth all sins. Now see, it... it if you don't understand what, what he's saying there, you can corrupt that. You can take that and you can make application like Ma Barker did. And, and you can actually do a lot of harm and think, well, it's okay because I love him. Brother John Calvin writes, he says, Solomon says that love covers sins as hatred proclaims them. For they who hate burn with the desire of a mutual slander. But they who love are disposed to exercise mutual forbearance. Love then bury sins as to men is it, see love is beneficial but it's not it, love doesn't excuse what you did love actually makes you fess up to it see love will bring you to a place to where you can see what you've done because if you can see if you can ever really see what you've done well your heart will be displayed now i'm not saying it's going to cause you to, to confess and repent and be a good guy that that's that I, but it, see it, it, it forces the decision Love has the person's best interest at heart. Now, if, my, if I have your best interest at heart and I walk by your house and it's on fire and I see you lounging on the couch watching television, I'm going to go beat on the window. You got to get out of there. The house is burning down. I say, well, the neighbors would think, oh, that guy's so rude. He didn't even go to the door and ring the bell. Look, he's beating on the window over there. You can see, if you don't understand what's going on, loves can become... Very um, superfluous. It's like, it's like you don't even know what you're talking about anymore. Love. Covered. Now, now, James, he writes, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul for death and hide a multitude of sins. See, this thing, you bring people to the point to where if they can see Christ, and, and how you can love them is help them see Christ. You bring them. 
They convert the sinner. Now, Brother Calvin again writes in connection with this, he says, James teaches here something higher. That is that sins are blotted out before God. As though he had said, Solomon has declared this as a fruit of love that covers sins, but here is no better or more excellent way of covering them than when they are wholly abolished by God. If God has put away someone's sin, how dare you bring them up again? Love covers a multitude of sins. Now see, we're walking in an, in, in an environment of the forgiven. We're walking in an environment where God has shed his love abroad in our hearts. And yes, there's some things that we've done and we're ashamed of them. And the last thing we need is to have another accuser of the brethren. Amen. We don't need them. You know, he was cast out of heaven and we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And the last thing we need is to be reminded. But see, flesh doesn't, flesh doesn't care how much you love God. If you offend it, it's going to lash out. And see, this is why, it's why we have these exhortations. Because we've got to suppress the works of the flesh and say, no, I'm not going to say that. That wouldn't demonstrate my love for them, would it? But see, some people are more, more inclined to being right than being right. We who have been forgiven of much sin ourselves are in no position to focus the attention of our brethren on the sins of the past. It, let's let it never once be named among us. Now, Romans... Paul's talking about, even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about sins that are covered. Oh, have fervent charity among yourselves, brethren, for love shall cover a multitude of sins. We need, we need this. We, we, I need this. We must never be found rejecting someone that God has given to Christ. If, they, if God's given them to Christ, so then let's receive them. Let's receive them. Because, you know, and they may be rough around the edges, but you, you, you just walk with them for a while. And you'll, you know what? You'll help them. You'll help them see areas and say, well, you know, I don't, I don't think I want to do that anymore. I'll never forget Brother Al. He was talking about this smoking. This guy was going to campus life, and he smoked. And Brother Al was talking about Jesus. They were on their way back, and this guy was going to light up. And they were talking about Jesus. And the man just crunched up his cigarettes and said, I don't want to do that. And he said, why? He said, Is it, we were talking about Jesus. It changed him. Thinking about God and about Christ and about how the glory is to come, it, this was, it, it, it was out of place. Amen. What happened? Love covered a multitude of sins. The question if someone has sinned is not even the question. All have sinned and come, and come short of the glory of God. So this really isn't the question. Is, well, do my brethren still sin? That's a dumb question. We, we're, we still have this flesh. We wrestle with sin. We wrestle against it. See, you can help. You can help in that wrestling. You can give someone something to wrestle for. Show them Christ. There are those who would properly teach others that we should forgive. We should, you know, I have my doctrine straight. You should forgive because God has forgiven you. That's a good doctrine. We got it straight. But as soon as someone sins against that person, look out. And everyone knows it. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't give away out of this. Mark eleven twenty six. 26, this is what he says. But if you do not forgive... Neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Now, no matter what you think about that, I don't know that I need a Greek lexicon, lexicon to figure that one out. This one seems pretty direct to me. That if, if you don't forgive your brother, God won't forgive you. Well, that sounds pretty severe to me. Yes. Forgiving those who have sinned against us. Oh, this is where it gets, this is where it gets hard. And it's on purpose that it's hard. How would you know what it was like to, to have somebody sin against God if they never sinned against you? How would you know that? You think your sin didn't hurt God? 
How about this one? Luke 17, 3. Take heed to yourselves. Oh, I like the way this one starts off right from the beginning. There's going to be some serious stuff here. There's going to be some people that can't get to the next part of this verse. Take heed to yourself. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Say, wait a minute. I thought we were just supposed to forgive him. I see love has their interest in heart, and it's not good for people to sin against you. Is that, I'm not going to just say, it's okay, you sin against me as much as you want, because God loves you just the way you are. No, God doesn't love you just the way you are. That's why we need Christ. There's parts of us that God won't receive. So now if someone sins against you, rebuke them. They shouldn't sin against you. It's wrong. And if he trespass, and if he repents... Forgive him. Now, now that's a good context. If the person sins against you, you let them know. Hey, did you know? By the way, did you know you sinned against me? I mean, it, has this even occurred to you that what you just did, you hurt me? Now, if they repent, forgive them. That's what you do. You forgive them. Why? Because that's what God did for you. All right, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, you'll beat him up. No, you forgive him. See, what is he saying? He said, this is kind of extreme, Lord. Who can receive this? This is one of those hard sayings. Well, take heed to yourself, because see what, what he's saying here, Jesus is saying, what I'm getting ready to say to you, this is the way it is. There is no, you're not going to negotiate with God. Say, but Lord, I, he did it six times. On the seventh, I just couldn't take it anymore. I just, you know, come on. How much do you expect me to take? Everything. Everything. Everything God sends your way, you are expected to. To take now, take heed to yourselves. See, the fact is that that God has put something in you that is capable of going through what He asked you to go through. Faith will respond and say, "Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord." See, and 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 the fact that God's forgiven you produces something in you that makes you understand what forgiveness is. Forgiveness isn't just something you do. That that, that is that is. See, forgiveness is something you have experienced. I've experienced my sins being forgiven. And I know what that worked in me. Now, do you love the brethren? Do, see, the, really, people who won't forgive the brethren, they don't love the brethren. This is the, how else could you reason this thing out? In other words, the, the, if they don't really understand what happened when their sins were put away, they won't be able to forgive their brethren. They won't. But if they do, now, it isn't like this is going to be something that's enjoyable. No one enjoys being sinned against. But it'll be something you understand and something you could enter into with your whole heart and your mind. And you can do it as unto the Lord, hoping the whole time that this brother or sister comes to their mind. You know, they get it. They get the point. Not everybody gets it on the first round. But see, our desire is that, that all the saints would, would grow up into Christ and that, that they would, um, it's what we're assisting them in. That this is part of loving them. We, have, we do have their best interest in mind. So I did... I could, I could tell that this was a, a very serious matter. Jesus, Jesus went into this quite extensively. Remember, Peter comes to him, Matthew 18, 21. And he says, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Oh. So um, Jesus said, I say unto thee, not until seven times, but until seven times, 70 times seven. Well, now, that's quite a lot. I mean, really, Lord? Now, we know from the Luke one that we just read that, that he very well could be talking about in a day. It wouldn't surprise me that the Lord would say that. <laughs> in other words, this is talking about something that's impossible for the flesh. It can't do this. In fact, I don't even know if there's enough time in the day for someone to, 
to, to sin and, and, and come to themselves and repent that many times in a day. And yet he says you do it. They're never, never going to come a time when it's going to be right for you to, to not forgive someone that's repenting. That's what he's saying. That's the point. This is, like I've already said, is one of Jesus' hard sayings. How can we possibly be expected to get this done? I mean, this is a lot of work, Lord, you're asking us to do here. I know that a lot of professed Christians do not really get what Jesus is saying here. But if you're in Christ and you have experienced forgiveness, you know what he means. I mean, it, you, you know. Even when people sin against you, you got to be able to see that they first, they've sinned against God. See, this, this, what they're doing to you is just a byproduct of what they've already done to God. They're not in fellowship with God or they wouldn't be sinning against you. Now, you got a couple different modes of operation here. You can decide you're not going to forgive them. I, I'm, I'm not talking just off the wall. I have experience with people who absolutely got in my face and I will not forgive you. Just leave. It's over. Okay, I mean, I see the person that has sinned against you, they're not the ones that kind of like lead you out of this, I don't think. They really did sin against you. They really did, and they shouldn't have. Now, imagine what kind of burden the person that you won't forgive is going to carry now that, because they know, I, I did something that has caused this, it's a hard thing to bear. You, you've actually sinned against someone, and, and now this, is, as a result, they refused. And now you know God's not going to forgive them. This is a lot this is bigger, more serious than people think. Sinning is more, is more serious than people think. But see, God does this. How, how, is, how is what's inside ever going to manifest itself or work its way out unless God allows these kinds of experiences See, God is in control of this whole thing. He really is. Now, we, Jesus went into a great, in order to answer this question that, that Peter says, Jesus goes into a long, elaborate parable about, remember this, this, this wicked servant, this, um, and, and, and he, 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 Jesus knows that this is, this is very important that we understand this, what's going on. It's, it's not something to be taken lightly. So Jesus tells us, and, and we, we just recently went over this, so I'm just going to touch the highlights of it. He says, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king. Now, we're talking about, well, we got a king in this parable. He, he's the king. Now, in, in these days, kings were like, they were sovereign. In other words, they could do whatever they wanted to. It wasn't like an American president. This is a king. Which would take account of his servants, and when he had become to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I looked that up, and under our standards right now today, that would be $8 billion for $400 million. $8 billion, $400 million. That's how much the man owed him. He brings him into it, pay what you owe right now. I'm calling it right now. You've got to pay me what you owe me. All right, well. It says, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all they had and payment be made. And we all knew it wouldn't be enough. I don't know how much people were sold for in those times, but I doubt seriously if it was $8 billion. So this, the, the, the whole point of the parable is he couldn't pay what he owed. The man couldn't pay it. And he's given us an example now about forgiving sins, about forgiving someone who sins against you. All right, so there's a man right in, he's... He, he can't pay his debt. Now, even though this action would have resulted in the king recovering part of his money, he wouldn't have gotten it all. There, there, there wasn't anything the guy could do to produce it all. And, and this action was right. The, this was the king. He really did owe the king this much money. So, I mean, he, it was not wrong for the king to, to, to call him into account and say, all right, you've got to pay this. This wasn't wrong. I've actually heard people say the king shouldn't have treated him like, no, this was right. This was right. Mm -hmm. Even though today people may have a problem with the dictatorship, this was right. He, he actually, the person belonged to the king. He was their subject, his subject. Jesus is making, he's helping us to understand that this is, this is the kind of government we're under in Christ. God owns everything. 
There's nothing we can keep from him. All right, so Jesus is showing us the, the, the one, the man was liable for the debt, and the, everything the man owned. Now, there's a lot of people who have a problem with this. Are you saying that he owned his wife? We live in a culture that won't accept that kind of thinking. The king didn't have a problem with it. The king said, I'm going to take her and sell her and your children. I'm going to sell them too. Now, you kind of get the impression of how serious sin is. How serious is sin? What kind of a debt does sin does bring upon you? And he's, he's just showing you this, this, these things have far-reaching. People think they can compartmentalize sin and say, well, I'll just keep it right here. No one will know. No, it has an effect on everything. Well, so the servant, he falls down. You know the record. He falls down and he worships, say, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. Well, the king wasn't naive. The man could have probably worked for the rest of his life and never been able to pay this debt. The man couldn't pay the debt. The king knew it. So he did something that was that, that changed everything. He was merciful. And he forgave the debt. All right? So we got, we got this, this man. He's out, he, he owes the debt. He can't pay it. The king forgives him. Then he goes out and he catches. Now remember, he doesn't have any money. Well, obviously he didn't have any money. He couldn't pay the guy. So he goes out and he goes to someone who owes him exactly a dollar sixty-three. A dollar sixty-three. So the the comparison is is almost comical. I mean, if you see this man, only what could you do with a dollar sixty-three? And that's not really the point either. The point is, is that the man didn't have it. The man didn't have a dollar sixty-three. He couldn't pay him that. And so the man who was forgiven much takes him by the throat and says, "Pay what you owe." And then he has him put in the jail for a dollar sixty-three. It seems like that would be like way too much work for a dollar sixty-three. But no, he did it. And it was to show the nature of the man. This was revealing there was something wrong. The man didn't get it. And I fear there's some that, that have had their sins removed. They really had experienced this kind of transformation that this man, no doubt when the king said, I forgive you all your debts, this man was happy and filled with joy. Eight billion dollars. I got eight billion reasons to be happy. And yet he goes right out and he forgets what happened to him. He forgets the experience of forgiveness. And he doesn't forgive. And this seems to me like this is the bottom line of what Jesus is teaching. Peter, you know, this is just my imagination. But at the end, you know, he says to Peter, I'm guessing he's saying it to Peter, probably all of them. But he says, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you. If you from your heart... Forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. So see, in the context of this, I mean, we can look at that example. And we can understand that example. But, but, but I know, I know in me that at the moment someone trespasses against you, all reason can fly out the window. Anger can take over and you could say, I, he shouldn't have done that. Well, no, he shouldn't have done it. But you shouldn't have sinned against God either. And so, see, we're called into, into a, a demonstration of the love of God when God sets up these circumstances in our life so we can demonstrate to principalities and powers in heavenly places. Now, they're looking on, and I can't find one record in the Scripture where God ever said, I love the angels. Uh, am I saying that he doesn't? God is love, so no... But I'm saying if the angels are ever going to learn about God's mercy, if they're ever going to see what the love of God is, his people are going to demonstrate it right. in forgiving one another, even as Christ, for God's sake, or God for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. See, the, it, 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 it's more than doctrine when it becomes real. When, when it is doctrine, I'm not saying it's not, but, but when, you, when it's in your life and you're living it, now, men see that and they say, that person's of God. I can tell that person's of God. Amen. Nobody could do what he just did. 
See, Ma Barker should have called the police. I know it was her son's. I know, I know it would have been hard, but she should have picked up that phone and saved somebody's life and called the police and had them kids arrested and taken away. Why? Because there's more to life than just you. See, we're called into an arrangement where God is going to demonstrate something eternal, something divine in your life. I praise God for the act of forgiveness that we can forgive others. We can, and we're called upon to do it. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Now, I'll close with this last thought. The angels, although they excel in strength, I mean, I don't think anybody here would say they're as strong as an angel is. And even though they're instant, the angels are instant in obedience to God. And they, these angels, they, they're the ones that are ministering to you. There's ministering spirits sent forth that shall, the, to the heirs of salvation. They're, they're bringing resources to you. Now they, they can be angered. We know that. Remember Moses said, or God was told Moses, don't, don't make the angel mad. Don't do it. We know they're holy. They're holy angels. We know they've been given certain charge over men, certain charge over regions. They even ministered to Jesus when he was here. The angels. And and women are supposed to keep keep their head covered. Why? Because of the angels. Because of the angels. They're here right now. They're they're, they're looking into this. They desire to look into these things. Now, what must they see when someone, they sinned against you? They did it. And you forgave them, and they go back to the Father, and they have good news. Remember, in our example here that Jesus gave, they were sorry. They saw what the man did, and they were sorry. But see, these angels, they can wing their way back to God and say, Father, I just witnessed one of your servants forgiving someone. This is the same one that I remember when he was in the pit. I remember the day you took him out. And now look at at what he's done, Father. He's forgave those that have sinned against him. This is the opportunity that God's opened up to all of us, that we can manifest the love of God. Oh, it's a a wonderful thing, and I praise God for it. Thank you, brethren.